the, uh, the MFA that you can see here and a PhD in Science and Technology Studies. Um, and Kurt manages to put that all together in ways that we hope uh, the rest of the school puts that kind of diversity and intellectual perspective together. Um, and then just one more little thing about Kurt by way of introduction. Uh, I knew that um, we had hired the right kind of person when very shortly after Kurt came, uh, I was getting nasty emails uh, from <laughs> people out there in the world that were complaining about how Kurt was helping uh, inform and organize people in, in civil society to ask informed questions about uh, helium fracking in northern Arizona. So um, welcome, Kurt, to Enlightening Lunch. Uh, the normal format, of course, is to for Kurt to go on for about 20, 25 minutes, have a Q&A, and then we'll excuse everybody who's not in uh, HSD 610, um, so the doctoral students can have a little closer conversation with Kurt. Kurt. <coughs> Um, can you hear me without the mic? Are you okay with this? Yeah? Here, I'll hold it anyway. We've got this mic stand button. All right. Now I'm the performer, the comedian. Um, this is for the camera. Yeah. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for this introduction, Dave. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I have quite a lot I want to get through today, so I'm going to sort of skip any sort of informalities. Um, mainly what I'm here to talk to you today about is um, this wonderful mural. Um, Science and technology studies, right? That's my field. It's essentially one of the, the roots of the um, School for the Future of Innovation Society program. It informs our thinking. It's not the totality of it. In fact, I'd say that we do STS plus, STS and more, and perhaps filling in the gaps that STS has not had the capacity to do uh, or not the willingness to do. Uh, but what STS has done well uh, in the last 30 or so years uh, is to really provide some useful tools for understanding social and political and cultural values and how they affect science and technological innovation, right? Um, it has some real deep histories and critical reflexivity of raising concerns about adverse impacts and unintended consequences and how the production of knowledge is deeply tied with issues of capital power and how that also marginalizes people in those debates, right? Furthermore, these STS sensibilities have readily demonstrated that scientists are non-neutral. They are wholly part of these economic, and political, and cultural projects of science and how they affect people. Now, in recent years, science and technology studies has also gathered various methodologies to actively expand who can participate in these conversations, right? Uh, we see conceptual frameworks like community-based participatory research and participatory design that are being borrowed from fields like uh, popular epidemiology, design studies, uh, uh, digital humanities, justice studies, and other places. Um, and these are, these are opportunities for us to not just understand these issues, from a discourse perspective, but also find ways to make meaningful interventions and participate in those interventions. Um, and this is what Gary Downer, Gar Gary Downey, rather, an STS and engineer study scholar, calls critical participation. Um, I go forward and perhaps suggest that this is also part of critical technical practice in which what we do also questions the things in which we're working in and working within and on. So the question I want to ask to one, uh, what do STS sensibilities bring to the of intervention? And two, how does this critical participation turn back into the STS sensibilities to think about what we do as practitioners? How do we be critically reflexive of what we are as researchers um, and not just, what, not just the space we are, we are studying? researchers. And, and this allows us to do things like reckon with the double binds and ethical dilemmas of doing research, right? And my audience is first and foremost the students in the room. Um, before you know, Dave asked me to do this talk and I just sort of queried a number of individuals, I said, what would you like me to talk about in the next hour? Um, and most of the people said, I really want to hear about how you got to be here. Um, I do have a, a little bit of a different past, having spent time in the nonprofit sector, having spent time on a, an advisory board for a regulatory agency, um, and then you know, now being here trying to do this work as an academic again. And I think there's some interesting lessons to be learned there, and I hope that you can take away some of those lessons for what you will do as researchers and are doing presently. So let me give you some background how I came into this work. So for the past decade or so, um, <clears throat> my work has uh, centered on understanding how concerned citizen groups are trying to make sense of um, oil and gas extraction, the oil and gas extraction industry in particular, um, and how that was proliferated by uh, the expansion of shale gas extraction using hydraulic fracturing, uh, and all the implicated infrastructures that that involves, pipelines, 
um, processing stations, uh, waste flows, um, and rail terminals, and all these other things that facilitate and allow the industry to expand in the ways that we've seen in the past decade. <laughs> Now, a persistent problem um, with these expansions uh, are that communities often, that what communities often sort of face in making sense of these complexities is a general lack of information about industry practices, uh, regulatory oversight, uh, and potential risks. For instance, um, finding you know, information on land that's leased for future oil and gas development is nearly impossible to find in most places. The same is that in true proposed pipeline routes, trying to discover where a pipeline may go. Um, some, site, some states have actually outlawed um, or, or you know, very heavily regulated what kinds of information can be released around violations um, or other kinds of information that you'd find on the industry. Um, and what this has led to, this sort of lack of accessible information, not only does it create a lack of transparency and governance, um, but these information flows could also assist communities in making sense of their entanglements, and it creates significant knowledge gaps and therefore significant distrust of companies and distrust of regulators, right? Um, now, one response to this, one consequence of these ambiguities has been the emergence of civil society groups um, working in partnership with technical service providers to answer questions that are historically ignored um, by government institutions. And this is something that we can conceptualize as undone science. Um, it's a science that is you know, typically funded by nonprofits, links to social movements. Um, and I echo what Kim and Mike Fortune, anthropologists and STS scholars Mike Fortune call a civic science. It's a science that emerges from this space um, that questions the state of things rather than a science that simply serves the state. And so whose science does it serve is an important question here, right? Now, as a call for thinking about STS intervention, um, civic science is also something that scientists think about as they pursue their practical projects. Um, and this is something that I want to get to today. Now, I entered this world in 2010 as a research assistant on a project, a recent you know, National Science Foundation uh, project that was uh, awarded to Abby Kinchy, um, my dissertation advisor, later dissertation advisor. And what we were trying to do in that study was understand um, the sort of emergence of these citizen science water monitoring networks that were you know, popping up all across the Northeast in response to shale gas extraction. And the primary questions in that research were, where are they getting their resources? Why do they emerge in some places and not other? It was very much a sort of political, you know, economic assessment of this movement. Um, having spent thousands of hours of field work, um, I came up with a lot of other questions after that project was done, mainly, how do these projects actually empower people? And are they even empowering people at all? Um, all these models of participatory science that were being bantered around, many of which were being supported by universities and millions of dollars of funding that was coming from agencies or nonprofits. But the fundamental question of whether or not those projects were actually empowering individuals seemed to have just been taken as a granted. It was taken as a given. And that was really my project over the three years following that was unpacking that. What were the affordances of that data? Um, what kinds of values were embedded in the ways in which people were thinking about the use of their data? In many instances, I found that the people who were funding those projects would not go to bat and advocate for those individuals who were out there every single day collecting that information, hoping that that science would one day move the needle on things that they cared about. So. Thinking about what actually empowers and disempowers, um, for those of you who are in your sort of, you know, approaching, you know, your, your maybe second or, you know, let's say maybe third or fourth year in your PhD program, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation has something called a dissertation improvement grant, which is a little $15,000 check that you can apply for, and it gives you the money to do things like sleep on couches and go into your field work and, and, and all the things that you're going to be asked to do for you know, $100,000 later, you, you're being you know, asked to do for $15,000 as a dissertation you know, researcher. Um, and I got one of these and it, was, it allowed me to go out to Pittsburgh and, and set up camp there for a better part of a year and a half. And I didn't want to just work in my living room. I wanted to be someplace that would put me at the crossroads of what was happening. Um, and I had come across this organization called the Frack Tracker Alliance in my research. And I'd interviewed them and studied what they did significantly. And Frack Tracker is an organization that's it's a nonprofit organization that spun out of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and its its mission was essentially to to do counter mapping and data transparency projects and other and digital storytelling and these these kinds of activities in partnership with groups across the country. 
um, that were trying to make sense of shale gas extraction. And um, I saw it as an opportunity to not only just sort of witness how that functions, how that kind of research functions in a space that's not an academic context, but also be part of that project and participate. I started as a visiting researcher. I finished the dissertation. And, um, and then we approached one of the large funders, the Heinz Endowments, and said, can we open up a new position called the Manager of Community-Based Research and actually find a way to do this from the ground? Um, and they agreed, and we created this position, and I filled that for about four years. Now, the very first thing that I went into, the very first project that I, that I initiated going into the organization was something called Knowing Our Waters. And this reached back into all of the field sites and all of the, the, the people that I had come in contact with in the dissertation and created a platform for them to be able to tell their stories, to be able to talk about how they cared about watersheds and what they wanted to do with their data and perhaps tell some of the narratives that they were not able to do when they were just participating in the science of the citizen science, right? And, you know, it, I saw that as a value opportunity. It, cr it created a space in which it was a co-produced project and the narrative actually belonged to the organizations and not to the researcher. Um, and that was an important lesson for me. And I came back around to it and I said, how do we actually instill that into the, into the actual fundamental process, the ways in which those projects get executed? I started doing something anytime I encountered a new project called difficult data workshops. Um, and it was to really embed this notion of kind of a co-produced model and the ways in which we would make sense of data. Um, and I, I pulled this out of the values and design research from STS. Um, and, you know, in addition to sort of the questions that might be asked in the room when we would approach a problem like there's a middle school in the front range of Colorado that's going to have a 30 head well pad right on the edge of the playground. How do we get the data that we need to make sense of that problem? In the background, as a, as a researcher in that space, you also have your sort of second hat on, you know, asking questions like, what's the appropriate intervention here, right? Whose questions are these? And, and, and if we find the answers, who do they serve? <clears throat> and you know, ultimately, what does this actually mean if we come around this full cycle for the ways in which people engage in scientific knowledge work? Um, and, and how does it actually build capacity and empowerment for them to be able to engage in those, in those particular issues? And so, you know, those are, those are the ways in which you have to sort of wear these, these sort of multiple uniforms in those spaces if you're doing engaged STS. You know, you can do the activist work, but you also have to step back and think about how you can answer your theoretical questions at the end of the day, right? <clears throat> I'm going to describe two projects uh, that emerged out of this process. One is called the Allegheny County Lease Mapping Project. So um, one of the fundamental problems, Allegheny County is the entire county that surrounds uh, the city of Pittsburgh, is that um, finding any information related to oil and gas leases, meaning properties that are, that are leased for future development, is nearly impossible. There's half a million properties in Allegheny County. Um, and you can chase any one of those individual records if you choose to, but finding ways to look at the overall patterns of development is something that the industry has a privileged knowledge of, but the public does not. And in fact, the majority of government officials from the local to the county to the state don't even have that privileged knowledge. And that sets up a particular knowledge gap. Important when we think about the politics of seeing and knowing trends and being able to engage with industry, right? So what we did after identifying what these sort of core questions are that people wanted to ask of this information, like how much land in my town is leased? How much land around my school is leased? Um, you know, who owns this particular property's mineral rights? Um, what we did is we went through uh, with the developer over the span of a year and scraped the entire county's registry of um, Office of, uh, of Deeds and Records uh, registry of all these leases and came up with some in the order of about 100,000 hits and reordered the entire thing into a, a relational database and put a new interface on it so that you could question the data in different ways along the lines of what we had created, had sort of you know, manifest within those workshops. Um, and this is the Allegheny County Lease Mapping Project. It's the first interactive version of any way being able to interact with leases like this that I know of. Um, and it had some powerful results. Um, for one, um, there's a paper that we just recently published um, that illustrates how a number of municipalities use this as a tool to be able to strengthen their zoning codes. Um, a significant number of uh, public interest groups in those towns were using it to be able to advocate for, um, uh, uh, in particular, identifying how um, oil and gas leases were mostly being uh, signed in residential areas, even though it's an industrial process, and how the mislabeling of this was creating confusion in the ways in which um, you know, land should be used. 
Um, and I think most importantly, what's happening right now is one of the county council members has proposed a full lease registry that would be public that would hopefully alleviate this gap. And that started as a result of myself and other people who, after completing this project, said, we need something like this. And so now it's being forwarded and it's being discussed. And as you can see, um, there's also issues of how do you enforce this because of you know, obligations of whether or not the industry would comply. So a second project I want to describe is called the Falcon Public EIA project. So in 2016, um, <clears throat> Shell Appalachia or Royal Dutch Shell announced plans for something called the Falcon Ethane Pipeline System that's going to bring ethane from the shale gas fields of Ohio and uh, southwest Pennsylvania to a giant uh, ethane cracker facility that's being built north of Pittsburgh. And this is essentially going to produce single-use plastics. Um, it's the purpose of the facility. So uh, when it's completed, it'll also be the largest source of VOC pollution in the state. Uh, and that's significant for people who live immediately around it. Now, one of the problems with this project is that the permits for the facility itself were fast-tracked through, and advocacy coalitions were looking for other ways to be able to engage with the project. And they said, well, they have to build a pipeline, right? Um, and so we started looking at any kind of information that we could find related to this pipeline. Now, this is the interesting thing about, we'll talk about ethical dilemmas in a moment. Um, but you know, as a, as a good researcher, the first thing I do is I go home to my computer and I type in Falcon Ethane Pipeline GIS files. And lo and behold, this whole server presents itself on Google because the engineering firm didn't password protect any of their files. <laughs> um, and so we sat with that for a while, um, consulted law clinics at Harvard and Penn for a while, and then decided to go for it. And so we spent the better part of eight months reproducing all of that data. Um, it wasn't a straight scrape. We had to recreate it manually. Um, and you, know, you can see some of the ways in which the files are organized here. But essentially, this pipeline, because of the ways in which it's uh, the jurisdictional regulations around it, was not required to go through full environmental impact assessment. It was just regulated state by state and pretty much, you know, are you crossing the waterways properly and are you dealing with sedimentation issues properly? And that's pretty much the only hoops they had to jump through. Um, whereas an impact assessment would have gone through a, a, a much larger you know, matrix of requirements before it would have been given a green light. So again, we did these difficult data workshops and we came up with a list of questions that people were really concerned about, such as, um, you know, where's the route going to go? Whose properties is it going to impact? Where are the water crossings? Are there endangered species in the way? Are there schools? You know, all these kinds of things that were really not even discussed in the, in the permitting review. We assembled all this information and um, and of course, Shell eventually submitted their permit applications, and then we released the entire project the next week. Um, and, um, and it was a full breakdown of interactive maps and all these different ways in which we had focused in and out of the data. And it was a full impact assessment, but it was a public impact assessment. It was driven by the questions that came out of those workshops. Uh, and I think this is really important to consider the ways in which questions drive research in different ways, right? And I'll just leave it at that for now. So what are the impacts of this? Well, for one, it extended the public comment period by three more months. It would have only been a 30-day public comment period, so the DEP was forced to respond to this. Um, a number of the issues that we identified in the project forced the DEP to also issue significant technical deficiencies against the permits that stalled the project, and they had to resolve those. And then most recently, it's been discovered that one of the counties um, that the pipeline travels through actually had significant gaps in the ways in which it was even reviewing the permits, and they've since had that right revoked from them by the state. And this was one of the pipelines that they got nailed on. Um, and it was the, the conservation district in that particular case that became the target of some of our work as well. So this is all great and all, right? And it's making interventions. What does it mean for engaged SPS, right? While you're doing this, this is one of the things too, right? Like I could have had a really happy life just doing that, but um, I was also getting up at five o'clock in the morning to write academic papers before I had to go into work in the morning because your job's not gonna pay you to do that, right? My wife can attest to this, she's in the room. Um, I can't do that anymore now that we have a baby. Um, but my point is that it's complicated, right? I mean, we, we privilege the writing here we privilege the standing back and what did we just do here? But you don't really privilege that in the nonprofit space in which 
It's about fighting the fires and dealing with the crisis and trying to apply the resources that you limited resources that you have to try and move the needle as much as you possibly can, right? So there's different priorities. The reason I bring this up though is that because how does this now rearrange what we think of as our responsibilities of doing engaged STS when we're maybe on this side of, of that line of the academic and sort of public partnerships, right? So, um, you know, in the bigger picture, all the projects that I just talked about really forward and highlight what um, you know, sociologist Evelyn Rupert talks about in saying that enacting the transparent state is a process rather than an event and the landscape of transparency is always changing as stakeholders and technologies and issues sort of you know, emerge, right? So if that's the case, then STS praxis also has to be critically reflexive and engaged with those movements. Um, and you also need to be thinking about what the material practices and what the informational practices. Um, you know, I published on this in, in terms of civic techno science and critical making and the ways in which we think about different modalities of technological arrangements that emerge from civic science, um, as well as different motivations of using information in informatics within um, civic science projects, such as in this recent paper in civic informatics. Um, this is the paper that I was talking about that just recently came out on the Allegheny Leaf New Project, if you're interested in that. And then, of course, building a scholarly community around this, right? And there are several that are emerging. Um, this is just a book that I put out, uh, edited volume with a collection of people mostly out of the applied anthropology world that are also intersecting with STS more frequently. And there's all sorts of methods that are coming in from that angle as well. So um, I want to just sort of, la two last studies that I just want to you know, raise here are, are ways in which I've tried to bring this into ASU as an engaged STS practitioner now here, sort of putting the academic hat back on full time. And I think that more than anything, what I'm trying to do here is create a space in which we can have these conversations, but also projects that are able to look temporally and spatially in, in longer and broader dimensions, as opposed to just dealing with the crisis state, but also ones that can rapidly respond to requests for knowledge and for assistance from within the academic community, right? So the first one um, builds on uh, the pipeline, uh, the critical technical practices that you see within civic science groups on pipelines to look at how is this happening at a national scale? Because while I might have been involved in, that was just one, but there were other pipeline related projects that I was involved in. This is a movement that's happening everywhere. And we hear a lot about the direct action. We hear a lot about the legal claims and we hear about you know, people who are sitting at protest camps. But what you don't often hear about is that there's this whole underlying layer of technical capacity that gets built within these movements in order for that to happen. You know, really complex engagements with permitting, all sorts of citizen monitoring or surveillance projects, all sorts of counter mapping that generate different narratives than what you might see within the maps that the pipeline industry produces, for instance, right? And in amongst all of this, you also see really complex layers of permitting and oversight that complicate the ways in which um, concerned citizens can actually engage in these projects. Um, you have jurisdictional issues. Um, other kinds of variables, such as, you know, if it's carrying ethane versus natural gas or oil, it's going to be regulated differently. And these are layers of knowledge that the public really doesn't have awareness of. And then on top of that, you have conflicting imaginaries about, you know, uh, what is the function of pipelines and how should we be thinking about them as enabling and constraining things to futures that we potentially want. So out of this has emerged a, a four-year project that is currently being funded um, by the JPB Foundation um, that is seeking to understand those practices at a national level. Um, right now, we're, we just finished phase one, which is, uh, well, we're, I guess, in the process of finishing up phase one, which is characterizing the state of this sort of advocacy movement nationally uh, and moving into phase two, which is going to be a broad survey to understand sort of the first, the first wave of understanding what it is they are doing as organizations. Um, and the subset of this is, um, from about 300 pipelines that we did analysis on, we narrowed it down to about 60 pipelines that have some kind of a sustained coalition that have emerged around them. These are the 60 so pipelines. Um, and we're starting to see, we're also analyzing this relative to coalition clustering. Um, and importantly, the ways in which knowledge, knowledge is actually flowing through these networks from one coalition to the next. Um, the ways in which, for instance, um, doing some field work in Pennsylvania this summer, the Constitution Pipeline that happened around 2013, the activists that had figured out particular ways to be able to engage with that from a technical, a socio-technical perspective, pass that knowledge along into the next coalition and into the next coalition, and how that has emerged in the ways in which uh, coalitions presently are able to do things like, I don't know that we would have been able to do the Falcon Public EIA project had we not built on top of all of that knowledge that had been you know, uh, amassed and emerged in the five or six years prior within that particular region. And we're seeing similar trends in other regions as well. So to me, the end goal here, if we go back to this slide, is this. 
you know, are, are, we're eventually going to be pulling up particular case studies to look at the effectiveness of those engagements with particular projects. But then eventually this, workshops, skill share and technical capacity building workshops, essentially difficult data on steroids with larger and longer funding streams to be able to have interventions that are durational and better informed because I think that oftentimes um, we take for granted that some of the engagements that we see within the, the advocacy community are, are working in the ways in which people think they are working, but perhaps they're not. And so this is, the, this is what we bring as researchers to this space is to be able to unpack that and try and get to the root of, of causality, right? And see if we can employ that in more, in more durational technical capacity building. And so, um, I just want to bring up one last project, and this is the one that Dave mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is where you sort of have your bag of tools that are always ready, right, for responses. First week I'm in my office here at ASU, the phone rings. We're a group of concerned citizens up in Northeast Arizona. We're making calls all over the country. Folks back east said that you just moved to Arizona. Can you help us? And I'm like, how did you find me? Right? Um, and, and so I said, okay, what can we do? And they, and they, they said, well, you know, look, we're having um, this problem where, and just in short, uh, uh, future technologies like superconducting, man, you know, microchip manufacturing, the space industry are consuming helium at record rates, and there's very little in the way of recovery processes for helium. Meanwhile, um, Stocks of helium are in fast decline and they're actually in sort of a state of crisis right now. Um, interestingly tied to the shale gas revolution because a lot of the helium that we had uh, recovered in the last 30 years or so came from conventional gas, but shale gas does not have residual deposits of things like helium. So in our transition from one energy regime into another, we've actually knocked out some of these rare earth gases and now they have to go someplace else to find them. Um, Arizona, Northeast Arizona and the Holbrook Basin has historically had some of the richest helium reserves in the world. Um, but that was about in the 50s and 60s at the bit of expiration. And so there's a lot of wildcatters that are coming back to the state, um, meaning exploratory drilling um, to see what's out there and whether or not they can strike gold. And so there's a genuine rush that's happening, but nobody can quite understand whether or not it is a, a boom or if it's a speculation, but it's causing significant confusion. And it's also causing lots of responses from within uh, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission that has not really, you know, Arizona is sixth from the bottom in the country in terms of oil and gas production. And so those regulations are not really up to spec with modern technologies. And these companies are borrowing certain techniques that come in from hydraulic fracturing. They're really scaring people. And these are things that I didn't understand. It was certainly not things that people in that community understood. And so we decided that we would collectively figure this out together, right? Um, and the ways in which we did this was to basically do community-based research methods workshops um, in which we would learn together what was happening, what was the differences in technologies, and in particular, how could that particular community of practice that we were engaging with find ways to, to be self-sufficient in being able to figure out what their own research questions were and figure out what resources they needed to put in place in order to be effective um, members of, of, of um, that group and engaging with helium extraction as well as sort of enrolling other people in the community that were concerned about this. And you, for instance, we did four workshops and you can see the, the organizing theme of those workshops and these are some of the emerging questions. But I want to take this back around to creating a space at ASU, right, for being able to do this kind of work. Again, in addition to having the intervention hat on, you also have the, what can I do with this, you know, as a researcher hat. And out of this project has um, emerged a lot of really interesting um, student-led work. Um, I think everybody's in the room right now, right? So I just want to also acknowledge Sherry Wasserman has been my RA on the, on the pipeline project and it's been phenomenally helpful. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I, we would not be where we are today if not for your organizing skills and your attention to detail and care for the data. Um, and in the helium work, um, many of you have heard of the board game that Catherine designed, and this was particularly important, not just for instilling the workshop process and everything that we discovered in that into an artifact, but also now it's a space in which other people can come into that knowledge and learn it and engage with it, and they can expand their community of practice through that artifact. Uh, Noah has been developing uh, the Helium uh, documentary project that now we're trying to explore ways in which that can turn into more of a digital humanities interactive project to put stakeholders in conversation with each other. And then we've also had a number of um, undergraduate SFIS uh, research fellows, such as uh, Sakshi and Pratik and, and prior people, uh, uh, Caitlin Hendricks and, um, and Bailey. Um, what was Bailey's last name? 
Reynolds, thank you, um, who have um, been doing white papers and fact sheets and other kinds of um, distillations of knowledge that we put on our website for people who come and look for it. So to summarize in conclusion here, um, I think that what I've, I've shown is that, you know, engaged STS practice brings certain constraints and affordances. Um, I'm suggesting here that STS sensibilities, um, you know, bring attention to things such as situated knowledge and multiple forms of expertise that exist in these locations and how they must be accounted for in these debates, right? As well as the intermediaries that facilitate knowledge flow through these complex systems. Um, it also has the potential to draw in um, all of these individuals into really critical, interesting projects um, that allow for critical thinking, not just for us, but as well as for the people who are interacting with. However, and these are all of the howevers of engaged STS, and these are the discontents perhaps, right? There's a lot of problems with this work. Um, one, the insider-outsider status problem persists, right? I have a lot of social capital that I bring into these projects because of all of my years in the nonprofit space. I can call somebody usually and say, do you want to work in this thing? And I don't have to start the relationship building first, right? The problem with a lot of academic research is that it doesn't afford time for, re for relationship building. You can't write an NSF grant and say, you're one's gonna be relationship building. I'm not gonna do anything. Just trust us, we're gonna make friends. They're gonna say, yeah, right, get lost. I'm not gonna pay you for that. That's what your startup money's for. Um, no, the, uh, the, the reason I bring this up is because the, the beautiful thing about that Harvard fellowship is that it's kind of no strings attached. And not only have I been able to capitalize on the relationships that I already have, but there's a, an understanding that the long approach is necessary to be able to do this kind of work. And I think that that's a limitation that exists in, in a lot of academic research, right? Um, the second thing is the political pressures of doing this work. As Dave mentioned, we've gotten complaints to high levels of the administration about the helium research and how it is misleading the public. It's hard to argue that you're misleading a public in a process of them doing a process of self-realization, right? If they're pissed on the other end of it, you know, maybe it's not on us, right? Um, there's another component to this too, and I didn't mention with trust, and that is um, when I was doing field work this summer, <clears throat> something to know about pipeline advocacy work is that there's a spat of bills that are being passed across the United States that are criminalizing pipeline protests right now. And some of them are particularly insidious in that they also criminalize people who assist pipeline advocacy in very um, unclear terms. North Dakota, for instance, and Texas are two. Um, these are ALEC-based bills that are just being sort of pitched to lawmakers and then getting passed over and over and over again in different states so that language isn't really being looked at closely and it's problematic because, um, you know, if I did this kind of work in a place that doesn't look positively upon it, could I get sued or potentially arrested as a researcher, <clears throat> aiding and assisting and abetting pipeline advocacy groups, right? Um, I've also been sat down by a number of our interlocutors and said, so if we share this with you, how do I know it's safe, right? If I share our tactics as an organization with you, how do I know that it's in good hands, right? So there's a lot of care for the subject and a lot of care for the data that you need to attend to in this work. Um, and the final point I just want to raise here is that if it's not obvious by now, engaged STS requires taking a side, right? And I would even say taking a stand. Um, and constantly sort of approached and questioned about this. Um, and personally, after 10 years of research on this work, my belief is that the oil and gas industry largely relies on opaque and predatory practices, values economics over people and environments. Um, and, you know, I say this not as an act of demonizing the industry, um, but just sort of stating the realities. Um, and perhaps, you know, uh, Benjamin Sovacool notes that there's nothing inherently um, necessary or inevitable in our relationships to the energy industry as they stand. And in the face of things like climate change and rampant pollution, expanding environmental justice and energy sacrifice zones, I think that we have a collective and an individual responsibility to question those relationships and figure out what capital we bring to the table to be able to do that. And as academic researchers, we have a lot of capital and power. Um, and, you know, this certainly, you know, you run the liability of being labeled an activist academic, right? But if we really believe in our STS sensibilities and the reflexivity and the idea that we are not neutral actors, that we all bring politics to the table, then we need to recognize our positionalities. 
You know, we need to, and in fact, I see it as a freeing thing. We can live our politics and create the world that we want to through our work, but it does not necessarily have to happen at the sacrifice of doing rigorous research. I might be critical of the oil and gas industry, but I'm also critical of the practices that advocacy groups use to engage with the oil and gas industry. And that's the object of my study. And I can be critical of that and objective in ways that are important. And I think that that's the distinction, right? So um, I think that's all I have. Um, I very rapidly in the last 20 minutes printed everybody activist academic badges that you're welcome <laughs> to wear. Because hopefully my call to attention here has maybe fired some people up that would be interested in wearing one. So you can pass these around. You can wear them on your heart, you can wear them on your sleeve, <laughs> on your forehead. If you don't want to wear it, we know that you still love it in the inside. And <laughs> that's what matters. Yeah. I get to put one on too here. There you go. Yeah, pass them around. So that's all I have. Um, I'll put my obligatory thank you slide up. Here we are. Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, with the deregulations from the current EPA, has that impacted your research work? <clears throat> uh, yes. And yeah, okay. are there any examples of that? Well, I'll. I'll um, I mean, there's deregulation happening across the map right now, right? Um, and uh, uh, getting to the helium project. People would not have even known about helium extraction in Northeast Arizona had it not been the fact that uh, the Center for Biological Diversity, which is a large national nonprofit that tracks um, uh, federal land um, leasing for extraction, um, sort of caught up in their net that the Bureau of Land Management was uh, set to uh, lease a bunch of land around petrified forests uh, for oil and gas extraction. And after a little bit more digging, they discovered that these were companies that were coming to look for helium. And that's what sort of raised the alarm and brought attention to this whole thing. Now, what complicates this is that at the exact same time, or, or I should say maybe about a month or two later after this discovery, um, the Trump administration changed the ways in which the BLM has to adhere to NEPA regulations, the National Environmental Policy Act. It used to be that prior to a lease of an oil and gas um, uh, or I'm sorry, prior to the auctioning of oil and gas leases on federal lands, you had to do an impact assessment. Well, they changed that now so that they only have to do the impact assessment after the lease is completed and when the permit is being requested. Um, but of course, so the, in other words, there's no opportunity for public input until the operator sort of hands the agency the permit and says, we're ready to be reviewed. And by then the horse is out of the gate. I mean, we know that these are path dependencies and inevitabilities that are hard to get away from once you get to that point, right? There's already a, a set of commitments that are in place, spatially and institutionally. And so that right there, that's what triggered all of this. I, more than anything is people really being ticked off about being cut out of the process, right? And I think that raises an interesting question, which is if we actually had, you know, a, 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 you know, a more just, way of people being able to weigh in in these decisions, would we have the amount of discord that we have presently? Is it, you know, I think that that raises that question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kirk. I really loved your presentation, especially the clarion call at the end to get us engaged. Um, so I don't, it's a comment, I don't know if there's a question in here somewhere, but um, I think it's somehow based on my own naivete. As I, as I get older, I spent some time with no more deaths, putting water into the desert with, with immigrants. And it was a harsh realization to realize I was fighting against the government to, to try to save people's lives. Uh, and so I'm hearing a similar story here. We talk about undone science, but I question whether the government and corporations are doing the science at all, right? Hmm. Uh, so um, as you... I don't know. I mean, so, what kind of concrete? It sounds like we have we have to, we have government democracy in, in progress in process, a work in progress, and we have to like do our own policing. Of, of, uh, I mean, how many citizens need to get up? And I mean, you're doing what the government should be doing, I would think, ideally, perhaps, right? So, I'm going to stop there. I, I, I don't know what sort of how. How is your work getting concretized into sort of standard governance, sort of some sort of regulation? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll, 
Um, I mean, these are slow moving battleships, right? Um, and I think that, I mean, democracy is about having the right to be pissed off, right? And saying something and potentially doing something about it. So I am exercising my democratic rights as a researcher by, by taking this position, I think, right? Now, when I served, um, I served on the Pennsylvania Environmental, uh, I'm sorry, Department of Environmental Protection's Environmental Justice Advisory Board for two years, from 2016 to 2018, and that overlapped my time while I was at the Frack Tracker Alliance. Um, and it, it corresponded in which the state was being forced to some, to some level to reassess its EJ policies in relation to shale gas extraction. Um, a, a vice president for one of the extraction companies said in just sort of a, a quippy tone at a conference that they did their best to avoid big houses when drilling wells. And then people were like, well, at least you admit it. Um, so now what are we going to do about it, right? And you know, it turns out that the policies actually, if you, when you did the analysis, like 5% of shale gas wells were actually in environmental justice zones in the state. And so then you have to look at, well, are the policies actually aligned with the realities of what's happening on the ground? Um, those were all the conversations that were happening when I was there. Um, so how does the work find its way to policy? Well, that, that's an interesting example. The, the very first meeting that I attended as a member of that board, um, the secretary was present and I was asked to do a presentation that was the more sort of complex version of environmental justice as it relates to shale gas extraction. Um, and none of these things have clear lines between cause and effect, right? Um, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen as a result of the Falcon Public EIA project? The fact that the Beaver County Conservation District has had their right to review permits revoked is pretty significant, right? So now the question is, how do you build something better? Um, and in the case of the advisory board, um, they went on to, the Office of Environmental Justice went on to develop their own tool, online tool that you can look at, you know, various industries as it relates to, you know, EJ areas. Um, they also did um, a series of listening tours throughout the state to try and get input from the public about you know, what they thought environmental justice was. Interestingly, about 80% of those comments related to the oil and gas industry. Um, unfortunately, on the final follow through, they only made minor tweaks to the actual EJ policies. But again, it's, you know, um, I think that just making those things known is important as well, right? It points to things that need to have systemic change. Um, and this is where I think you also reveal the differences between the sort of practical voice of do you change it from within or do you fight it from without? Um, and I don't think that there's an either or there. There's something both. And there's a position for all of us, depending on where we want to stand and what our politics are, to do those projects from both sides. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So a lot of your work deals with this interesting 20th century challenge of the compromise between a desire for economic growth and a desire for some sort of environmental preservation. And what that looks like has shifted a lot in various moments in the 20th century. How do you even begin to engage with that larger imagination of what, of what economic growth should be and should look like that keeps driving certain aspects of this challenge? So essentially, the, the question of did everybody here. Um, the first I started here in June of last year, so a year and a half ago. Um, and about three weeks later, we found ourselves in Washington, D.C. Um, for CSPO related stuff. And while there, I went around and hit all of the offices of large NGOs that I had relationships with and said, if you had a wish list of projects that you want to work on, what would it be? Right. We had a wish list of resources, you know, Sierra Club, Earthworks, and RDC. Um, and over and over again, I heard, you know, what we don't have is enough skill economics of this industry. We'd love to have economists on board because what happens within environmental advocacy movements is predominantly you find people who are arguing about protecting environmental spaces, protecting people, protecting, protecting. And then the industry comes back and says jobs, economic growth, development. Um, and there's no counter argument. It's, they're speaking different languages, right? And so I think that there's an opportunity in there to, to find a way to go toe to toe with that. And there actually has been, um, uh, so the uh, Delaware Riverkeeper and a few other organizations hired an economist to do a counter analysis on one. Um, and they did it very quickly um, and found they were very easily able to debunk so many of the claims that, and in the end, the pipeline was not built. And so it shows that, again, that's an aspect of undone science. You know. Um, uh, I got the opportunity to meet Gina McCarthy, <clears throat> who was the former EPA uh, director, 
um, last year. She said, you know, if we had spent more time talking about people who live in cities as opposed to polar bears when we started getting concerned about climate change, we probably would, would be where we are today. And I think that that's the same response. It's like if we actually start thinking about the ways in which we go toe to toe with the arguments of the industry as opposed to other ways that we have been caring about these issues, then we may actually have different travel. Um, so, um, one, actually, we ha one of the um, one of the slides from the the helium project um, was an economics analysis. We had a Barrett Honors student who came and did a big you know analysis from the national as well as the local you know economic analysis of the helium industry, and it was amazing what was revealed in that, and just a sort of scratch you know scratching the surface. And I think that we need to do more of that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. So much of the work you did previously was around these, uh, around oil and gas and the pipelines. And then there's this shift that's to this sort of interesting outgrowth of something that's happened into an into helium and a new industry. Uh, so I was just starting to think about if if we reach a point where actual use of oil as a combustion material that starts to go into decline that and there but there's still pushes for things like the ethane the ethane production facility for plastic in in uh in pennsylvania or helium or all of these other things that have been being produced sort of as a byproduct of oil and gas combustion mm. now becoming more of a driver of, of development? How do you think that will affect, I guess, environmental advocacy? And how would you how would you start to direct some of those efforts into a more positive direction? Um, so that's yeah. a, that's a really insightful question. How many people here uh, attended the Energy and Society Conference this summer at ASU? Nobody. A few people. OK. What was one of the things that we heard from the keynote? The climate wars are over, <clears throat> right? We have, the science has won out, industry understands, you know, bridge fuels, future, la 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 la, right? Uh, we're getting off of natural gas eventually. But if you read behind the numbers, what you see is, and if you look at the energy projections, they're expecting almost all of their growth in the next 30 years to be from natural gas liquids, ethane, propane, butane, and so we may not be burning this stuff for, for home heating and in our stove, but yet they're looking at it as the gateway to a giant plastics industry and other, other byproducts. And in fact, the, the big sort of thing in, in central Appalachia right now is we're turning it from the rust belt to the plastics belt. That's like the model because in addition to that large ethane cracker facility, there's three more that are permitted. And this is all byproducts that are coming off of the white gas from the Marcellus and Utica shale regions. That's the model of growth. And so it complicates things when you say, man, it's amazing that we're finally making this energy transition. Industry's not going away. They're taking advantage of the fact that that's the narrative that people are buying into, and they're finding ways to do this work in the back end. And in fact, the Department of Energy just funded a huge, you know, multi-billion dollar study to build salt caverns underneath the Ohio River Valley to be able to store all this stuff so that they can have durational long-term assets of ethane in particular to support this industrial complex that they're building out. So this is happening. <clears throat> now, in response to what do advocacy movements do about it, remember how I was saying a few moments ago that one of the problems of research that happens in the nonprofit space is that it tends to be very project-specific, crisis-prone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> this is where I think that academic research has something to offer. Um, even regionally, and we see this within the pipeline research that we were talking about, but elsewhere, coalitions that exist within states don't even necessarily often talk to each other because they might be structured based on institutional affiliations or funding lines. So some funders that only fund work in New York, for instance, that want to touch Pennsylvania or vice versa. And it creates a lack of communication. It, you know, we talk about knowledge systems with STS. These are, these are discrete and non-communicating knowledge systems that have a lot to share, but they're not for particular reasons. Um, now, when you have large geographic build out around things like a plastics belt, a salt cavern facility that's going to supply ethane to you know, a four state region, trying to mobilize a coalition around that is very difficult for those inherent reasons. And you're always 10 steps behind, certainly when you're getting billions of dollars from DOE money on the other end to support that narrative of growth and development. 
And that's where I think that when I was talking about the, the pipeline work that we're doing now, we have the opportunity to understand these from the level of systems, understand how they affect politics, how they affect people, how they affect environments. We have the ability to bring in talented teams on large grants with co-PIs and, and bring a different level of understanding there that I think that when we partnership with advocacy groups, hopefully allows for that connective tissue to function more rapidly and more efficiently to engage with those problems. And I, you know, I actually bemoan the fact that I did not extend some of the work that I was doing to look at that plastic spelt problem, but I have a lot of colleagues who are, and, and they've been making some really interesting gains, and I appreciate their work. Okay, well, this will be recorded, so lawsuits pending. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's it, right? We'll send it out to all the wrong people. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Thank you.